Good morning. Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, I'm excited really to kick off this series and share with you guys. Uh, you know, and I, I would say this, throw this out there right now. Pastor Kirk, uh, it, you know, sometimes people are like, where is that guy? You know, or this guy, you know, he's being selfless, going to Canyon City, going to help out the brothers and sisters down there. So uh, we just appreciate our pastor, right? He's an awesome guy. Um, And we're praying for, for the Sandro family and for Carter. But I do want you guys to take this booklet, hold it in your hand for me, okay? Um, if you have not gotten one of these, they, they should have given you one as you were walking in. But if somehow you slip through the cracks, then you can go back to the info desk. And we have these um, available for you. And then also, if you are a digital reading type of person, we have a PDF version of it on our website, which is canyonviewchurch.com. So go and check that out. There's, there's lots of different ways you can get it. I love this, okay, because, because it really, really, really is going to be something that's going to help us deepen in our faith. And, and I, I think that I think it'd be really cool if you committed to just going through it for the next several weeks, okay? Um, yeah, it is. Like he said, Pastor Kirk said it. It's five days of study with you or with you and a loved one or however you'd like to go about doing that. And then there's also a sixth page, which is to do in your cell groups, which by the way, if you're in a cell group, put your hand up real quick. Yes, dude. Aren't you guys so blessed by that? And then if you see that and you're like, I want to get in a cell group, you saw someone's hand go up, let's just make it happen, okay? We're going to do some speed dating cell group style after the service. I'm just kidding. Um, Really, though, I mean, I, I think it's going to be a good time because Pastor Kirk said it this way. Um, he said, the reason we're embarking on this important series is to give us tools we need to grow as followers of Jesus. And that, so and we're going to keep referring back to that. This, the reason we're doing this, the reason why this series is, is coming out to you guys right now is because we want to grow as followers of Jesus. And no matter where you are today, you may be someone who's just kind of walking in the back door, kind of kind of checking things out, and that's great. You're in the right place. We're glad you're here. Um, and also, no matter where you are from there to, you've been here since the beginning. You've been really, your life has been built upon the foundation of Christ. Our hope is that no matter where you are in the journey with God, that we would invite you a little bit deeper into a relationship with God, okay? So that's why we're doing this, and that's the endeavor that, we, that we're embarking on together. Um, and oftentimes, really, churches are, have a hard time getting practical, because the way that church services are built, or so, uh, lots of church services run just like this, where we have worship together corporately, um, <clears throat> which is amazing. We have an amazing worship team that does that. And then we have announcements offering. And then it's more of a lecture format, right? Where I talk and you listen, or I talk and you text, or whatever it is that you do. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? And, and it's more of this Greek lecture style of learning where, where it's not as much about par practical participation or practical application necessarily in the way that this service is built. And so what I love about this is it gives you something tangible and something practical to take and use, okay, so that we can actually help you throughout, between the Sundays, right, all the days in between, that we can help you grow as a follower of Jesus. And this, this study guide, I want you guys to know, this, this series and this study guide has been almost a year in the making, because all of the content was produced in-house, and there's an awesome team of people that worked really hard to produce this content for you guys. So I just wanted to say thank you to the team who developed the series. Would you guys just give them a hand? Like, thank you so much for doing that. Um, what a cool thing that is, okay? So, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself as we're kicking into the message. Pastor Kirk said it's God's story. I grew up in church. So I grew up sitting where you guys sit as a different church, but same type of thing. I grew up going to, um, going to Sunday school, going to children's church, and, and I learned about the Bible a lot growing up. I actually even went to a Christian school in elementary school, um, and I know some of these people from there. I know uh, Sue and Tim King from there and their, and their kids, and, and I remember learning a lot about God. I remember memorizing the scriptures but I learned about things in such a way, just the way the chips fell, I learned about things more like one story at a time, right? If you've ever been to children's church, um, you, you had the felt board, 
right? That was back in the day. I don't know what they do now. They probably have like holographic images of Jonah. I don't know. But I don't make it out there a lot. But that's, that's what I envision we should push towards. But either way, it's one story at a time, you know? It's the felt board. It's the puppet shows. It's the songs. I just found this CD that was like Christian songs in reggae form. I was putting it on for my kids, and they love that because I play bass, so they have, they have the, the funk in them deeply, I can tell. So, but either way, you know what I'm talking about, right? You, you know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm probably not the only one who's heard the stories of the Bible in sort of a compartmentalized fashion. Like, there's the story of Adam and Eve, right? And then some stuff happens that we don't know about. And then there's the story of Cain and Abel. And then it gets pretty crazy there. And then Noah, right? And you keep going down the list, and there's story after story, and all of them, uh, a lot of times, have been, have been produced in such a way that they're trying to give a moral truth out of those things. And I'm not saying that there's anything completely wrong with that. But what I am saying is that taking the Scripture out of the context of the main storyline can be dangerous. Okay? Because there, there is, we can, easily, we can easily go down that road and, and focus in on a chunk of Scripture. And I'll, I'll give you an example. It's in 2 Kings chapter 2. Okay? There's a prophet named Elisha, and apparently Elisha is bald. And there's a group of, it says 40, I think 40 youths or 40 children, depending on which version you read. And they started making fun of him for being bald. And do you know what happened? Bears came and mauled and killed these kids or youth. So if you take that story and you, you pluck it out of the context of the whole Bible, you're like, man, God is very serious about us not making fun of each other, right? <laughs> and if I were one of those kids, I guarantee you I would be dismembered by a bear because I am just that type of person. So I would be done. If that's the way that God operated, I would be not sitting here before you today. So, so you understand what I'm saying? You can paint a picture of God that doesn't exist when you take parts of the story out of the context of the whole. So today, what my hope is that we can set the stage by looking at the overarching story of the Bible, okay? That we can, we can take the story and we can see that that. It is one story. And that we can see that it tells one truth over and over again, many different ways. And you know what's actually even true about us in our lives is that we can't even understand our own stories until we understand the context that our stories are actually a part of a bigger story. We can't even understand what our life is supposed to be about. And we can go and try to make our way and sort of make a rabbit trail of where we want our lives to go. But I'm telling you the truth today, you don't even understand your own story until you understand it within the context of a larger story. And our stories are set in the context of a story that is much, much greater than our own. And it's much, much bigger than us. And that's what we want to look at today, okay? So will you do that with me? Will you give me a few minutes to, to take this apart with you? Let's pray before we get into it. Father, we invite you here. God, we believe that you are moving, that you are actively moving right now among us. We're coming off the high of just a packed out Easter weekend where your gospel was proclaimed, God, where hearts were, were coming to you, God, in droves. And Lord, we, 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 we piggyback off of that and we continue off of that, God, the excitement and the anticipation of what you will do. That God, you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And so we can stand on that, Lord. I pray that you would reveal truth to your people. God, and I pray that we would just respond in worship to you. We love you, God, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so if we're looking at the big story of the Bible, we're looking at the Bible as this beautiful sonata, okay? And what I want to do is tell you that we'll look at it uh, in, in terms of these four great movements, okay? If, you, if, you ever, if you've ever listened to a symphony, if you ever listened to a, a composer, they write in movements. And there's one movement that's very upbeat, and then there's another movement that's very dark. 
And you see there's kind of an ebb and flow in music that happens that way. We're going to look at the Bible in these four movements. And, and it's crucial that we understand again that the four movements tell one story. That there, there is one story, and it's the story of rescue. It's a story of redemption. It's the story of a God being the main character who is choosing to redeem or choosing to rescue his people. And so the context for your story is you are the redeemed. You are the rescued, okay? We're not the superhero of our lives. We're actually a lot more like the, the people in the burning building that need, that need a rescue, okay? So we have to understand that. And I'm going to paraphrase a bunch of the Bible. I'm actually going to try to paraphrase the whole Bible and, and it's, I'm going to be paraphrasing a lot rather than reading out of the Scripture because it's for the sake of holistic comprehension, okay? So, so I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to spin a tale that doesn't exist. You, you can take it to the Scriptures, okay? But I'm going, to, I'm going to say that the first movement, the first act in this play that we're in, the, the first part is the part of creation. And usually what I'll do, uh, I'll give you a little tip if you're ever teaching the Bible to somebody. Usually what I do, before I read a scripture, I set up the context. But we're going to Genesis 1, 1. And so I don't really know how to explain what happened before Genesis 1, 1. I'm going to tell you what, it was dark. Uh, there was some hovering happening. And we weren't here. So that's, that's what you need to know. Okay, this is how it goes. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, okay? And so that, that's actually pretty important to know. I feel like I didn't give a whole lot of information that a lot of people didn't know. If you're a creationist thinker, if you, if you buy into that, if you believe that, then you kind of know that that's what happened, right? Right? But, but what, this is very, very important because this makes God the main character. It makes God the main character of the story because he was before all things. And it actually shows that our origin comes from him, that there was nothing before God, and he decided to bring this world that we live in into his story. The, our point of origin and everything that we see comes from him. And this statement also makes him sovereign. And if you've never heard that term, the word sovereign is another way for saying he's the boss. Because there was nothing, and he decided that he wanted there to be more than nothing, and now there's more than nothing. So he's the boss. If we can do that, maybe we can be the boss. But it seems to me that if we're going to buy into this story, we're saying he's the main character, he's the boss, he's sovereign. Our point of origin comes from him. Not only does our point of origin come from him, but we're going to see that in the creation movement of this story, that our design and our purpose comes from him. Because again, he's the boss. He's making the rules. He's calling the shots. And that is, like for our American brains, that is hard to comprehend all in itself, right? We're not in control. He, he was before us and before all things. But stay tuned, because after this series, this summer, I know a lot of people tend to check out of church during the summer, and I'm just going to invite you to not do that right now. Because we're doing a, a series called Beautiful Design, in which we are going to, to look at how we are built as human beings, that we, are, that we are the image bearers of God, and we'll see that here in a second. And because of that, we have a, a specific design and a specific purpose. So stay tuned for that. And this now, this part of the story is where our oldest ancestors come in. And it's Genesis chapter 1, and it's verse 26 through 28, and it goes like this. Then God said, let us make man in our image. That's where we get the, the, the notion that God is more than one separate. He is three separate entities in one. Because he says, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, 
be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the earth or excuse me over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth so what god has done at this point in the story is he's created a scenario where we could have purpose where we could live by our design where we could practice being the image bearers of god we could practice being like god he created us in his image in his likeness and it says male and female both in the image of god with different qualities, different attributes, but both equally valuable and important to God, right? And then he says, I've given you something to do. I've given you a purpose. You you should have dominion and subdue this earth. He created this garden. It's called the Garden of Eden, and in it, everything was perfect. And I think it could stand to reason that when he says subdue the earth and have dominion over it, he could say all the rest of the earth make like this. And so he's given us a job to do. And then after he created man and woman, he said everything was very good. After every day he created something, he said it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. When he gets to us as his image bearers, he says it's very good. So he also gave them a rule too. Not only a job, but a rule. This again goes back to the idea that God is sovereign. Adam's not making any rules. Eve's not making any rules. The one who makes the rules, obviously the boss, isn't it? Isn't that how it goes? Because my my kids try to make rules to me all the time. They like to make up rules as they go. Like, you got to eat your breakfast, Abram. He's like, well, only on Wednesday. You know, like, that doesn't work when you can't make the rules. You can't just jump in and like add in a rule. And we know how that goes. So, so we're going along, we're going along, living by purpose and design, and this actually gives, gets us to our next point, the next movement in the story, which is called the fall. And we'll read about it here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, just one verse. Because we'll, we'll, what we see here, though, is that their, their one rule is to not eat of this, this one particular tree. And then a deceiver comes in, the serpent comes in, and he starts to challenge their thinking a little bit and say, did God really say this? And and here we pick it up right here. So, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was standing around picking his nose, right? Who was with her. And he ate. And you could say, man, what a dork that Adam is. But then, like, put, put the mirror on you. And how many times have we done the same thing, right? So the consequence for this, though, is massive. The perfect order that God had created, the parameters that he had given man to live under, is now broken. And God had to separate himself from man. See, what happened in the very beginning was that God and Adam and Eve would walk together in the garden in the cool of the day. That there was a time where there was perfect communion, perfect relationship between God and man. And there's a Jewish word, that, that, a Hebrew word that goes perfectly with that. It's, it's the word shalom. It means perfect peace, perfect order, where everything is as it should be. And that is now broken and God is separating himself, and it creates this chasm. It creates this great divide between God, a perfect and holy and sovereign being, and man, a sinful and fallen and evil now being. And so instead of, because when I was a kid and I would make things out of Play-Doh, honestly, I had probably about the same artistic ability as a, a rock, but Um, When I would make things out of Play-Doh, it would inevitably not turn out the way that I wanted it to. And so what would you do, right? Just mash that thing down, get it back to a big ball again, and start over. Isn't that what you would do? But God, and he, he created something that he believed to be very good. And instead of mashing the Play-Doh back together, saying, let's start this thing over again. Let's get this thing right. We'll eliminate serpents. That will eliminate the problem, maybe. You know, instead of doing that, God set into motion a grand plan to make it right, 
to fix what was now broken and with the mercy of God, the justice of God, and the grace of God. You see it woven into every story you read. So when you read the scripture, you remember that God had a plan to rescue his people. That is the overarching story that you see. And ever since this moment, ever since Genesis chapter 3, it's been a process of God making all things new again. And it's been a process of God fixing what was broken with people that are broken. All the while remaining to be a God that is just. So Abraham was the starting point. And I love the way Andy Stanley says it. He says, uh, how, how did God choose Abraham? You know, was he a special guy? Was he, was he, no, he really wasn't. It's just when you see, like, our, my kids have Legos. Anybody, anybody ever step on a Lego? <laughs> oh, man, what a pain that is. And, like, my kids tend to just, you know, like, dump the Legos all over the place. And how do you pick up, how do you start cleaning up a mess that big? You just grab a handful of Legos, right? There's no strategy. when It's covering every square inch of your floor. There's no real strategy. You just bend down, get some Legos, start there, right? And that's what God did. This mess that we had made through our own sin, God chose a guy named Abraham as a starting point, and he chose to make a lineage from Abraham to make a nation, which is the Israelites. And, and then the Israelites became a nation, and they were chosen by God. And they were separated, and they did things differently, and they operated differently. And God was with them, and God was speaking to them. And then God set them free because they became a slave nation. So God gave a guy named Moses the law to guide them after he rescued them from Egypt. And so they gave this law now, these commandments. And, and, and we're supposed to try to live up to this law. But you know, the problem is we're broken, right? The problem is that ever since sin entered our lives, there is something mechanically wrong with us. And no matter what, we can't keep all these commandments. And so, so what God has done during this time is his mercy really comes into play. And he's saying, even though you can't, I'm not going to punish you yet. I'm not, somebody has to pay for this sin because he's also a just God, right? But for a while, he's going to look over those sins. He's going to overlook the failures of the people and he's going to have them stick to this law and really use the law as a guiding force and also as a flashlight to shine onto our brokenness. And he's saying, but eventually somebody's going to have to pay. And the prophets began to speak as a messengers of God and there was also kings at this time, okay? So what kings did, they were, they were leading the nation and it would be one king would be running hard after God, and the next king would be running as far away from God as possible. And you see this up and down roller coaster, and all throughout that there are prophets speaking as messengers of God. And then they start to talk about something. They start to about, talk about something that we just celebrated. And hundreds of years before Jesus ever set foot on the earth, prophets were saying, one day there's going to come a Messiah. There's going to come a rescuer. There's going to come someone who's going to save us. Because if you were to look around honestly, you would see that we need help. We can't do this. And in fact, the Romans says it this way, that we actually find, basically find new ways to sin, and each generation finds a way to, to push further against the boundaries of God than the last. And continually that's been happening from Adam and Eve on down to us today. So you see this story, and you see the people just being broken. And it's very apparent that they are not going to ever live up to this law that's guiding them, and that they need help. And the gap seems to be ever widening between the perfect and holy God and the broken and flawed people that were once in communion with God. And so then what happens is we move into the third um, movement of this story, and it's called redemption. So after generations of God's mercy saying that I'm going to overlook the sin, you guys can make sacrifices to cover your sin, to put a Band-Aid on the, on the massive wound, right? It's like you got shot in the, you, you know, in the leg and 
we're able to sacrifice it by putting a band-aid on it. You know, he's able, we're saying, okay, we can try to fix this for a minute, but eventually we're going to need surgery. Eventually we're going to need some help that we can't do on our own. God says, after all this time of mercy, someone had to pay the price for the sin of mankind. Because if nobody paid the price, if he just said, you know what, I'm going to let it go. Does that make God a just God? No. And we hate that side of God because we fall under the judgment of that. And we fall short of, of, the, of the price. And we actually deserve the penalty that God wants to give. But God's saying, I, I'm going to fix it. Again, I'm going to fix it. And there was this grand plan of rescue. And so when you read the Old Testament, woven throughout each page, woven throughout each story is a common theme that God is going to one day make it right. And so he sends his son to become the sacrifice for our sins. God sort of, he sort of cheats the system in a sense. He's saying, somebody has to pay, but these guys don't have enough to pay. Because even their righteousness, God says, is like filthy rags. Even their righteousness is garbage. Even the times when it seems like they're doing pretty good, it's actually not really that good. And they don't have enough to pay. So God sends his son, Jesus. And no one seemed to be faithful enough to earn right standing with God. So the grace of God says, there's a price that's too high for you to pay and I'm going to pay it myself. And so what we celebrated as a couple of weeks ago, the screen was, was, was up with images of, of Jesus Christ being beaten and Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. That was the story of rescue. He put himself in the line of fire. He put himself as the punish. He took the punishment of our sin and just laid it upon himself because he was here from the very beginning to rescue. And you see that that culminates there. The climax of that story is God paying the price and us now having right standing with God by being clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And that by faith, through the grace of God, we're able to be rescued. And so when you see this, this scripture, this is probably the most quoted, most memorized scripture of all time. John 3, 16, it goes like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And when you realize that, when you read that compartmentalized, that sounds really nice and cute and sweet, doesn't it? But when you read that in context, of generations of people ever widening the gap between the perfect God. And you read that in context of your own life that you know how hard and how far you've pushed yourself away from God, apart from the grace of God. That becomes the most amazing statement in all of the scripture that we have earned this. We have earned the right to perish from our sins, and yet God sent his only son to pay the price that we couldn't pay. And when you start to think about it in that light and in that context, it really begins to come alive. But what's awesome about this is Jesus paid the price, and then he also again shows his sovereignty because no grave could hold Jesus, right? And he defeated the power of death. And there's actually now for us no fear in death. And we get to celebrate. And that's why we get to come. And, and even though we know that there's a part of ourself that still, even after become, coming to the, knowledge, the saving knowledge of Christ, we know there's a part of ourself that is still ugly, right? It's still broken. It's still messed up. If you could see in here, if you could see in here, I would be so embarrassed. I'd be ashamed of some of the things that go on in here. But we get to celebrate because we see that Jesus has defeated death and eventually our sin, will, our, our sin is paid and eventually we will be free from this. Eventually God will make all things 
new again. And it actually gives us a cause to celebrate how good God is, and we don't have to try to live up to a law that we could never live up to in the beginning. We just accept this free gift that Christ has given to each one of us. And the last movement of this story is the movement that we're living in right now. It goes from the time Jesus ascends back into heaven and the time the early church in the book of Acts begins to form until present day. It's, it's called the movement of restoration. And we see, though, God, in the midst of all the brokenness, in the midst of all the pain, and in the midst of all the hurt, God is making things new again. And when you look holistically at the big picture, it seems like things are getting worse and worse. But when you actually start to see, God is drawing people to himself, left and right, and God is working on us at a pace that maybe seems slow and maybe seems small to you, but God is chipping away at the ugliness, chipping away at the brokenness, chipping away at the hurt and the pain, and we're being sanctified, meaning we're being made more and more to look like Jesus, more and more to be the image bearers of God that we were supposed to be all those years ago in the garden. And I love that the way Romans 5 says it like this. Romans 5, verse 18 says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, he's talking about Adam, Adam and Eve in the garden, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord. So he's saying, one man messed everything up. And now through the sacrifice of Christ, one man is making all things new again. And where sin has come in and it's taken over, when you weigh, when you weigh the amount of sin that's in our world and you weigh the amount of grace that God has, grace overpowers the sin. And so where does that leave us? Because if we're honest with ourselves, we know that we're, we're being restored, right? Right? Some of us are being made more into the image of God. And, and really, it seems like we're taking like two steps forward, one step back type of thing. What, what I think we're left with is a choice, is, is an option, because we go throughout our lives, and, and, and stories are very important. We're all living a story right now. Your story might feel like it's super boring, it might feel like it's super mundane. It might feel like it's super exciting. Maybe you're, you're setting goals and you're just smashing them. You're, you're, just, you're just doing all the things you ever wanted to do. Maybe, maybe right now God really has his hand on you financially. Maybe right now you're, you're just super blessed. Your kids are serving the Lord. Whatever it may be, maybe things are going awesome, but we're still left with this question if this is an overarching story and the context of our story only really is valid when we put it in the context that it's part of this bigger story, we have to kind of face up to the fact that sometimes we, we've been living as the star role in the story of us. And I'll say this, you actually have two options. You can be the star role in your little, small story. Or you can sacrifice that role and become a part of the greatest story that was ever told. Because see, what we do is we say, well, I like being the star. I like the attention on me. And honestly, a lot of the people who come up here and do this, the, the lights, we like that. If we're honest with ourselves, kind of like it. I like to be the star. But if we realize how small, and because you read these scriptures and you read this story, and there are people 
I mean, doing these amazing things. And there's just generations of people that go by without any mention in the Scripture. And their story is so small and insignificant when you put it up against the larger whole. That's still going on today. And I can be the star of my own story. I can pick the theme music, right? I can pick my supporting cast. I can pick which angle, you know, like my good angle that I want to be shot from. But it's still just this tiny, tiny story with the larger whole. But I have decided and I have endeavored with my life after feeling and experiencing and knowing the goodness of God, when you see these scriptures come alive to you, I'll lay down that small insignificant story all day long. And, and I may never even get into the credits of God's story. I might be a blip on the radar. I might be behind the scenes. I don't care. I want my life to be part of the greatest story that was ever told. And that was a story of rescue. And I want our lives, and maybe you want your life to matter, to have eternal significance. That maybe because of what, the way you live, maybe because of your obedience to the Father, you're able to see people come and be rescued. You're able to participate in the rescue, in the redemption, in the restoration of your brothers and sisters. Maybe you're able to see what it's like to live with this kind of purpose. Would you just pray with me? God, we just ask that your spirit would come now. Lord, would you invite us deeper in? Would you invite us deeper into a relationship with you? God, some of us have walked with you a long time. And some of us are still not even sure whether any of this is true. But God, would you invite us one step closer to you today? That one step may be even just coming back another week. That one step may be joining a cell group. That, that one step may be talking to your neighbor or your friend. But God, would you just invite us a little bit closer to you? And Lord, I pray if there, are, if there are people here who are starring in the story of them, God, maybe you're asking them to give up their star role in a small story and join the supporting cast of the greatest story ever told, the story of the rescue of the fallen people, the story that you're redeeming us and restoring us to once again be your image bearers, to once again be like you, to once again have communion with you, God, to have relationship with you. Lord, would you do that this morning? We love you, God, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. As we stand to get ready to worship in one last song and reflect, uh, I want to give you a couple of things practically to take away. During the song, would you ask yourself this? Um, do I want to be a part of this story? And there's lots of reasons to say no. Because of past hurts, because of what happened the last time you decided to get involved in church or get involved with Christian people or you trusted people in general. There's lots of reasons to just stay in your own story. But you really have to ask yourself at the end of the day, do I want to be a part of this story? And as you begin to work through that, I pray that God would just help you and that you would come here and, and receive next steps for that. And the second thing is, if you say, yes, I want to be a part of this story, I want you to commit to the, following this study guide. Commit to reading each day. It's not that long. It's not that big of a sacrifice. But commit to getting to know the main character of the story. And, and as we worship today, would you just ponder on these things? Let's worship today, guys.